Hi, I'm George Hammond, conference producer at Technology Networks, and I'm here to introduce our next talk, When Technological Innovations Converge, The Rise of 3D Printing, VR, and AI in Elevating Synthesis and Remote Collaboration. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Stephen Hilton. Dr. Hilton is an associate professor at UCL School of Pharmacy. His research explores 3D printing and virtual reality applications in synthetic chemistry and pharmaceuticals. As the inventor of the IKA flow, he pioneers continuous flow technology with unique 3D printed reactors. Dr. Hilton's work is driving innovation at the intersection of technology and pharmaceuticals. A very warm welcome to you, Dr. Hilton. Following the presentation, we will also have a Q&A session, and we welcome any questions that you may have. Please ask questions using the Q&A system to the right-hand side of the video player. And now, without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Hilton to begin his presentation. Lovely. Thank you very much, and thank you for the introduction. So I'd like to tell you today about our research on 3D printing. And really, it's then journey into virtual reality and AI. And really, it's about, I guess, a story about our journey into really making chemistry easier and more accessible. So my background is synthetic chemistry, and a lot of our work has been focused on medicinal chemistry, making small drug molecules, making them active and selective and potent. And in doing this, we found a lot of barriers, things that we couldn't do. And so we started to explore 3D printing simply because we couldn't sometimes get the reactors we wanted, we couldn't get the reactor shapes that we needed, and we started to make those things that we needed. As we went on that journey, we also started to think about monitoring, the ability to quantify data and work out what's going on. And we then moved into the area of low-cost electronics. More latterly, we've been focused on integrating AI and virtual reality. And ultimately, we view this as a central tenet of our research now, where all our programs really are an integrated approach to technology focused on enhancements in chemistry and pharmacy. So in terms of the research overview, as you can see in the top left, we've done a lot of work on small compounds targeted towards anti-cancer drug discovery and neuroscience drug discovery. And some examples of those shown there. As we developed our work and in making those molecules, we needed to improve the synthetic roots. And that's where we went towards 3D printing and catalysis. We also wanted to scale up the production of a lot of compounds. And that's where we moved to the bottom left into continuous flow chemistry and photochemistry and photoflow chemistry. Really because it's the ability to scale up with this that is uh, optimum for Medicam programs. But when we look, started to look at this, we realized there are huge barriers to this. Another big driver of our research has been virtual reality of the last three, three and a half years, simply because of the ability to collaborate across the globe as part of our research programs. And we found the tools weren't there to do this. So we started to work on that. Other work in the group focuses on the pharmaceutical aspect or pharmacy aspect of drug delivery. Again, thinking about how we get drugs into polymers, how we release drugs into patients and personalized therapies for patients, but also point of care diagnostics and how we quantify drugs in patients. I guess where it all starts really is our laboratory and how we think about the laboratory. Because again, when you lay laboratories out, it's not just isolated equipment throughout the laboratory. This equipment has to be integrated. It has to create data streams. And a lot of the work we've done over the last few years has been focused on that approach. Where we take work at the fume hoods, where we then take work at the analytical section of the laboratory, and then we work at the bench, and ultimately then analyze that data in the office. We have to integrate all of this into the same workflow. So the ability to have quick access to data, access to instrumentation, but ultimately, ultimately making an integrated total laboratory that way. So why 3D printing? Why is it such a useful tool? Well, we focus on two main types here. There are others, but these are ones that are easily accessible for everybody. So SLA based printing and FDM printing, where we take a thermopolymer or a liquid polymer and make a structure. The reason why 3D printing is so useful is it because it gives access to a range of materials that we can create a structure for and an application. And that sweet spot means that we can make anything that we want with a range of materials and an array of applications. 
So if you've never seen it, it's a fascinating thing to watch. We can take a polymer, we can pass it through a hot nozzle, and using this robotic arm, or XYZ coordinate arm, we can lay that structure down on that melted plastic into a shape that we've programmed into one that we desire. And in much the same way as FDM printing, SLA printing is the same. Here we have a liquid tray of monomers that is then polymerized by a laser to create a solid structure. And you'll see the green light passing through the liquid on the right hand side of this process. And as the tray lifts up by one layer, the liquid runs underneath, and the laser then polymerizes the structure underneath to create the structure that we need for its application. So these are our two main types of 3D printing. But ultimately, it's the ability to create anything you want based on whatever you design or design that you find. And the reason why we first started getting into 3D printing was this. If you look inside most laboratories, it looks like this. You find tens or twenties of years of research that is balanced on a glass shelf due to the lack of a flask holder or in the freezer shown below where people use old bottle caps. This is crazy. Why would you? risk so much research just on an old bottle cap, why not get appropriate storage? Well, partly the problem is the one of cost. Below we have the commercial st um, storage solutions in the red holders, and these are hugely expensive. These go up to about £30 each, just for a small piece of plastic. Shown above, you can see the ones that we actually make ourselves. So we 3D print these structures, and this was our first venture into 3D printing trying to find a solution to the problems outlined above. And you can see here the huge price differences, 80 pence to make these, these ones versus 30 pounds for the commercial version. And when you look at the laboratory, the cost saving is enormous. Just on this one item in the laboratory, we have saved almost 4,000 pounds for our laboratory, meaning we can use that money for other things. And one of the nice things about this is you can share this with others with 3D printing. So this starts to get you to the idea is that we don't have to stick to the status quo. When we looked at the cost saving effect in 2015, we reasoned that UCL alone could save 25 million just on implementing 3D printing. How can we do this? Well, you're looking at a saving of 9,000 pounds per laboratory, leading to about a 400,000 pounds saving per um, building. And with 50 buildings containing laboratories, you can see how this figure is achieved quite easily. But this was a huge understatement. At the moment, we've probably saved about 700 to 800,000 pounds in laboratory just on equipment alone using 3D printing. Again, it's not just about objects that you have in the laboratory, it's more your imagination. Here you can see some happy PhD students in the uh, lab office. The problem here is a lack of space and everyone finds this in a big university or big central uh, town and university. But with 3D printing, you can invent things to solve a problem. Again, getting the keyboard area cleaned up and put away with these 3D printed holders means that this desk space is much more better for using. For using. And again, you can see the design. You can access this yourself if you want to use that. Please feel free to download it. It's all free. Half the thing about this is the sharing of the knowledge and the sharing of different objects around. So what about the belief of convergence of 3D printing and its extension into virtual reality and ultimately into AI? Well, a lot of that work was based on a need. Again, we had all this great work in 3D printing for chemical synthesis and its applications, but also that revolved around people. And when you start to work with people around the world, it becomes more challenging. You have the difficulties of time zones and the work towards this. And as you'll see as we go through the talk today, how we've started to address these issues and make collaboration and cooperation much simpler and more effective. Again, one thing you'll note with our collaborations across the globe is they involve multiple time zones. And that's really been a big driver and up for us more recently for AI, giving us the ability to have, in effect, offline subroutines of people such as Matt shown here, that can speak to others around the globe, even though he's fast asleep in bed. And you'll see why that works a bit later. Why do we really start thinking about developing change in chemical synthesis? Well, let's go 28 years ago. Here I graduated in chemistry and you can see here the benches where all the work was done. The students or PhD students and postdocs around me, that's the fount of knowledge who knew what was going on. And what you find is that in 10 years after that date, nothing's really changed. The environment's slightly different. 
you're still working at the bench. But in 10 years ago, or 10 years after that, you start to see the advent of computers and laboratories. Following on from there, in 2021, we uh, described our first use of PCs at the laboratory Fumebird. Uh, again, for us, this started to be a natural progression, but people found this quite surprising. Just a couple of years ago, three years ago now, putting computers next to fume hoods was viewed as quite a big development. But these are simple low-cost tablet PCs that allow you to enter data exactly where you're working. And so we've really started to use this for the purpose of logging of data and telemetry, giving us the ability to act, interact with instrumentation wherever it is in the laboratory. And partly the problem with chemistry is it's pretty much stayed the same from 28 years ago in terms of how we do this. And so we started to think about how could 3D printing affect this? Because when we carry out a reaction, we do a reaction setup. We carry out the reaction for a period of time until it's complete. We do a cleanup and finally a purification. And in 28 years, that process hasn't changed at all based on when I did my degree and sort of carried through my PhD and postdoc. And even now when you chat to chemists, that process has stayed the same. Yes, there have been advancements. We can make reaction setup simpler and easy to do by using carousel reactors. We can speed up reactions using technology, robotic technology, and we can also speed up purification by automatic systems. But ultimately the process is the same. We mix reactions with the magnetic follower, which mixes the reaction by stirring it around, and we leave it to react and, and do what it does. And that stayed exactly the same in over 30 years. We started to think, could we change this? Because when we looked at our scale-up work, we observed these types of problems, where the reaction mixes, stirs round, but ultimately you have poor mixing of reagents and you have mismatch in the reaction concentrations. And you see how the, the addition of reagent doesn't really change the mixing in the central column for quite a large period of time. Again, when we carry out reactions, we weigh out reagents, reagent A, reagent B, and catalyst X, add them to the flask, and allow them to mix, dissolve, and carry out the reaction. We wanted to change that because if you want to carry out multiple reactions at a time, we wanted to avoid the adding of the catalyst. And so what we started to think about was, could we think about our magnetic follower or mixing device here, and change it from a simply an inert device into one that is a catalyst? So here we then have a, a device that also mixes the reactions and catalyzes at the same time and avoids the weighing out of reagents. In terms of this, the reason why this is useful, well, rather than actually add, add the catalyst, you add it straight to the reaction. There's no need to weigh out the catalyst. And at the end of the reaction, you can simply remove this from the reaction, taking the catalyst away. It also offers the prospect of cleaner reactions and reusability, making the entire process simpler and more effective. And ultimately, it allows chemists to reduce costs and the time taken to discover new medicines. So it's a new way of thinking about how to do chemistry over the last 30 years and change it to a new concept. And the other thing as you can see here, the packaging was designed to replicate real life. So most of you are familiar with the idea of Nespresso pods, the ability to quickly pick a type of coffee that you want, make the coffee that you want and the taste that you want. And we wanted to do the same for chemistry. We wanted packaging to be simply reflective of this approach, where we have acidic components, copper-based catalysts, basic reactions, palladium-based ca uh, catalysts, and simply uh, catalyst-free stirrers. The idea being you can open your pod, add it to a reaction in exactly the same workflow, but now avoiding the need to weigh out catalysts. And we thought it'd be a very simple idea because again, the same workflow works for us at home, can work for us in the laboratory. And we designed this approach in exactly the same way. Here you have your catalyst of choice. So here we have a zinc-based Lewis acid catalyst that can just be added to the reaction as desired. And what we found with this process is, is that it makes chemistry far simpler. Now that reaction setup time is reduced uh, by about two thirds, the reaction itself is also reduced in its reaction time because the catalyst doesn't need to dissolve. You're passing reagents continuously over the catalytic surface. The cleanup is also vastly reduced as well because we can remove the catalyst from the reaction simply, easily, and efficiently. The purification is also simpler because the reaction is cleaner and more efficient. And in terms of our approach, you can see here why it works so well. 
one of the key things that we wanted to do was to move away from the traditional surrogate design into a more complex shape here, shown here on the left. And what we have here is our 3D printed surrogate device where we insert the same magnetic follower into the cavity. This then mixes the reaction far more efficiently than the simple surrogate alone. The reason being that design allows fluid to flow through the surface of these holes and come out the side of these surrogate devices, making the reaction far more efficient and mixing also more efficient. One of the nice things about 3D printing is you can make any shape that you want. In the same process, we can make a whole range of stirrers for whatever task that we want, going from microwave reactions, carousel based reactions, brown bottle flasks, or larger batch that, uh, type overhead stirrers. And you can read about this in the paper uh, shown below. When we look at the mixing, you can see the computational effect here matches what we see in real life. Simply stirring up these two different devices at the same rotation speed, you can see here the vortexing for the 3D printed stirrer device is far better than the simple stirrer alone. What this means is the reagents are, put, are pulled through the surface of the device and over the surface far quicker than simple mixing occurs. How does this affect reactions? Well, here you can see what it does here. A normal powder catalyst with the 3D printed stirrer is the reaction flow here. Here is the reaction profile of the embedded catalyst. Far more efficient and quicker and ultimately also cleaner. One of the things that we hadn't expected was that these reactions are also more stable because the catalyst was more stable and that it can be reused in a range of reactions depending on what you want to do. We published it on this work, but this is an example of how we can make chemistry simple and more efficient. Having looked at batch chemistry, we wanted to move on to scallop chemistry for this reason. When we carry out reactions in batch, mixing is always um, not as efficient as we wish it to be. When we carry out a reaction that should work, and again, some of the reagents are converted through to products, because of the poor mixing, what we can see here is that some reagents haven't mixed and haven't been converted through to products. And what this means is that after about 20 hours, we get reaction completion. Some of the products that was formed early in the reaction has potentially been exposed to harsh conditions that can cause it to degrade, leading to inefficiency. And so we start to think about, can we go to continuous flow? And can we also think about 3D printing in continuous flow? Because in this approach, flow chemistry is far more efficient. What we have here is a reservoir of A and B, and using uh, continuous flow pumps, we can pump very small packets of that reagent into the reactor at any one time, where they convert through to the product and pass out the other side into the container. In a short space of time, we can then pass all of our reagents through to get our products out at the other side of the reaction. And when we looked at flow chemistry, what we found is it's difficult to do. The systems themselves are hugely expensive, roughly about 20 to 100,000 pounds per system. And it acts as a barrier to entry for any person wanting to do flow chemistry. And this shouldn't be the case. One of the other things that we also found was that the flow chemistry is big and bulky and blocks access to the fume hoods as well. So one of your big expense real estates in laboratories is blocked by the high cost equipment that is also reserved for a narrow array of chemistry. Continuous flow chemistry is hugely crucial. It allows fast mixing as I mentioned. It also allows for efficient heat transfer. It allows for control of residence time and increase safety because of the small mixing of reagents at any one time. It's easy to scale up and it's an enabling technology because you can plug different modules in you, into your continuous flow path, making it simpler and easier to carry out. Now, in terms of 3D printing, we wanted to develop our own system. And this leads on to the collaboration and convergence with technology. We developed the ICA flow in partnership with ICA starting from our very simple concept shown here on the left hand side in august 2018 and this is a product that came to market in less than two years so concept through to market and ultimately sales but if you look at the, the timeline here we started very early on just before the pandemic and even though the pandemic hit we were still able to bring this to market because of the combination of 3d printing and virtual reality and ICA being a fantastic company to work with gives us the ability to collaborate with fantastic scientists using virtual reality as well. 
And you can show here the development timeline where we had our prototype with 3D printing, which we then took to ICA and some design concepts, our first prototype, and ultimately the commercial system in 2020. And again, if you look at the timeline of working with this, this was our laboratory during COVID where I was working at home in the garage and the setup that we had where we had 3D printing and a lot of the work going on uh, in the garage downstairs where we could actually carry on our work in collaboration with ICA with the team's flow chemistry. And the reason why this worked so well was because the system that we designed was not big and bulky. We minimized its structure. We designed the system to run without electronics and simply to be linked to a low cost sterile hot plate that is ubiquitous throughout the laboratories because that could provide the heat source for the reactions. Our system runs off compressed air or nitrogen gas, which is applied to a bottle containing liquid. That liquid is then forced out of two tubes on the left and the right via the pressure source that goes into two mixing chips on the left and the right, allowing you to inject reagents into the flow path that can then go into the system as reagents get converted through to products that comes out the other side in exactly that same process. Simple, easy, and efficient. Analogous to any flow system, but now at a fraction of the cost. The system we also designed was based around the premise that scientists should have access to anything they want to carry out reactions, but also the ability to make anything they want and mix it with existing equipment. And for this, we designed reactors uh, out of polypropylene that we 3D printed, shown here, you can see the flow path. And these need to be daisy changed, daisy chains in exactly the flow path to extend it, or modify it for whatever you want. It's also extremely low cost. These are about 15 pounds per kilo for a roll of plastic, and so the reactors that we can make in the laboratory are around about a pound each. And you can see how that saving of 800,000 pounds can be easily realized using this approach. But using the same approach, we can also make chemistry more efficient. We can take our same reactor here, our same system, which is normally um, a sort of unitary system. So it's like one process after another. And we can switch it so that it runs in parallel because we can switch, we can split the um, Reagents that are mixed here into two different paths, left and right, on the same system. So now we can carry out two reactions in parallel, looking at two different residence times on the same flow system. A really great way of thinking about flow chemistry and making it far more efficient. We can also carry out reactions with catalysts. And so you can see here some of the other examples, where here we have catalyst embedded reactors. Here we have other reactors such as PVDF or SLA based printed reactors or chemical synthesis, making the chemistry far more accessible. We can also think about different shapes of reactors, such as these monolithic systems for a range of catalysts, depending on what you want to do. Why are virtual reality and 3D printing linked? Well, ultimately, these two systems look disparate and separate. At their core, we have CAD design. In the 3D printing world, we take a digital design and we um, then convert it through to a physical object. In the virtual world, we can take physical objects, digitize those, and view them with a virtual reality headset in the virtual world. We can also use the same concept in education and training. Here you see our early work in 2015, where we are looking at 3D printing for undergraduate education, where we can actually have in-person training, and we can bridge the gap between Zoom Teams meetings by giving the students the ability to put on headsets and discuss those same concepts with us that you can't do in a Teams Zoom meeting. Virtual reality was also crucial for the development of the ICA flow because during 2019 and 2020, we were working with um, chemists in the US and Germany to develop the ICA flow from concept through to market. We couldn't actually phys physically meet up in the pandemic. And the only way we could meet up was with virtual reality goggles from the UK, the US and Germany using Real World One software. And this really pushed us down the idea that actually we should really start thinking about how we develop virtual reality in our laboratory because it is so um, usable and effective and speeds up collaboration. Another factor which also um, pushed us into virtual reality was the pandemic. Because again, we were developing a lot of solutions for um, NHS hospitals across the UK during the pandemic and making um, PPE more accessible for medics across the UK. In a short space of time, we were able, easily able to access uh, face shields and oxygen flow devices for the NHS within about two weeks. 
and we're able to run an entire manufacturing program during lockdown, uh, distributing over 7,000 face shields quickly and efficiently using 3D printing and a network of 3D printers and 3D printing um, academics across London, across UCL in a matter of weeks. Using distributed manufacturing, demonstrating the power of 3D printing and its applications. We also in the pandemic started to think about uh, virtual reality and developing our own software. Because again, taking that same concept with students, we wanted to think about, could we take our, our physical models and view them in the virtual world? And so in the pandemic, we started to digital twin our laboratory, trying to make it more accessible in that way. We took our physical laboratory, digitized this, and you can see here the very early results of this. On the left, we have a video of the virtual, uh, of the physical laboratory. And by placing on a set of virtual goggles, you are transported to the digital version of the same laboratory in exactly the same way you would in real life. And it gives you the ability to actually uh, meet anyone across the globe in the digital version of the same laboratory, exactly the same way you would, you would do in real life now, but without the commuting aspect. So this is a game changer for thinking about how we can actually showcase different models in the laboratory. Again, you can see the early versions of the ICA flow and some of the testing that we're doing to ensure fit. You can see some of the 3D printed models in the laboratory uh, on the left-hand side, the physical versions of which you show, uh, saw before. And so during the pandemic, we started to develop our own virtual reality software, which has been used across the globe. And we decided to make it more accessible. The immersion of virtual reality goggles is incredible. And the Quest 2 3 is really fantastic for that but not everyone has access to this. And so we also decided to develop our own PC software that can also be used in link mode. And again, the two of these work seamlessly. So if this person's using PC, you can see the same person and chat to them if you're wearing VR headset. And the reason why we think this is a fantastic approach because working in VR, you can send headsets, not people to conferences. You can bring people to laboratory in ways that you couldn't do without a plane flight across the globe. It allows for real-time interaction, and it's as close as possible to real life that you can get via digital twins. It also enables anyone across the globe to have training um, in, with equipment that would not be accessible in the laboratories. An example of this is what we've done with undergraduates. We can train over 200 undergraduates in HPLC systems using virtual reality headsets. And now this is a concept which is uh, impossible in real life. You couldn't train people um, on the physical systems simply because they're inaccessible due to their cost. So not everyone can have their own HPLC system, whereas now we can do this simply and easily using our virtual reality software. In terms of access with VR, this is the way we tend to think about things. We think that virtual reality should be accessible in the same way that we, that we do in real life. And so what we've pioneered is the concept of virtual buildings. Here we've developed a virtual reality flow chemistry institute to train people in flow chemistry across the globe. So users can jump into this either via PC or Quest headset and meet us and be trained in flow chemistry without having access to the physical systems. The building itself has a range of facilities, so conference rooms, meeting rooms, training rooms, poster space in exactly the same way as you would do in real life. But what we also wanted to do was to think about how do we collaborate? Because the best collaborations often happen in the same building because you can meet people easily. You can see what's going on in real time. So is a reaction working? What's happening about that? And so what we pioneered the development was, uh, was this the Proteus Ether photochemistry system. This gives users the ability to look at digital data from a photo reaction and understand it in real time, what's going on with there and optimize that simply and easily uh, via temperature display we can modify the temperature of the um, photochemistry reaction that's going on. Our system is designed to be cooled by compressed air, so we can actually regulate the temperature of the reaction because the Kessel lamps that we use for photochemistry kick out quite a lot of heat on the reactor itself. And so by taking the heat away via air cooling, we're able to regulate the temperature and create a steady state that we want for this process. The reactors that we designed are also designed for parallel photochemistry in exactly the same way for that you saw before because in the same reactor, we have two channel flow paths. We can have two reactions going on at the same time, or we can loop back the system or incorporate inline analysis with our 3D printed reactors. 
Now, React data is sent to the cloud. So again, this can be viewed with a virtual reality headset anywhere in the world to understand what is going on. And so our aim here is to have multiple systems across the globe. And we've already pre-placed this for an experiment that's going on shortly, where users can actually upload the telemetry to the cloud and we can interact with this wherever you are. What we've also incorporated is digital laboratories where our cloud data all comes back into the same virtual space so we can meet up with each other across the globe. One of the problems with that is it's great doing all this amazing work and having amazing people in the laboratory. But what happens when they leave? What happens when you want to have a meeting with somebody in the US and India or China or Australia? And it's very hard to have joint meetings because of the difference in time zones. And we wanted to start to think about, could we use AI to solve that problem? And the way we started to think about this was having AIs in the laboratory that you can speak to to understand what's going on in real time, but also understand what's gone on in the previous 12 hours where you're asleep or less, um, and can help you with that process. And so we started to think about AI co-pilots in the laboratory you can speak to while a process is going on that help you with going, um, carrying out a, a process. And it allows you also then to um, navigate chemical inventories, uh, health and safety, and general laboratory setup as well. And we've pioneered this concept here. So with these three AIs, Sam, Susan, and Ingrid, and you can hear from Ingrid how this actually works. So now I'm going to um, run a short video where you can hear my voice speaking to Ingrid shown here. So Ingrid allows you to um, chat to her and she'll tell you what's going on. And in much the same way as you chat to Ingrid in the next video, you can see here it's not limited to English alone. Here we run a video um, in Arabic. So here you see the HPLC training um, that we had. And this is a fantastic way of thinking about global accessibility to people whose first language might not be English. And so we think this is a real new approach to actually making chemistry and training far more accessible wherever you are in the world. But one of the exciting things about this collaborative photochemistry project is Jarvis. Jarvis is our AI that actually has access to live streams of laboratory data. I can interpret these and help you solve problems in real time. There's about a 30 second gap between what's happening in real time across the globe to what Jarvis knows, but ultimately it gives Jarvis the ability to interpret data and help you solve and improve your chemical reaction. Jarvis can also discuss this with anybody across the globe uh, in real time. And Jarvis also has the ability to speak multiple languages. How does it work? We can see here on the next video where I actually chat to Jarvis about what's going on in the lab. So you can see here how Jarvis actually really helps you understand processes that's going on. What does it look like in real life? So here you can see the laboratory where we actually um, look at the same concept here. So here we have a process ether system where someone's holding the temperature to change the temperature and seeing the speed of change of that, of how it interacts with Jarvis. And again, you can see the feed from the uh, global temperatures and the live temperatures, and ultimately the temperature and the fume that's going on in that same system. So again, that ability to link up and combine data is a really fantastic development. And ultimately, linking of AI into that process 
is incredible. So really, I think our, our journey demonstrates that it's the combining technologies which really brings the biggest innovations and also the speed of innovations. The ICA flow, which we took to market in less than two years. The Protus syringe pump, which will be coming out shortly, uh, a low cost syringe pump for flow chemistry and flow photochemistry, and a fraction collector, which will also be described shortly. The ether, which is a fantastic way for global collaboration, our catalytic stirrers and our VR AI software. So where are we going next with our approach? Well, ultimately, it's the ability to interact and actually cause change in the laboratory via virtual reality or digital interfaces. The use of Arduino of the low cost electronics is a fantastic way of interacting with any system in the laboratory and for building your own equipment and making it accessible to everybody. But ultimately, it's that ability to have two way control from a VR headset wherever you are in the world to make sure things are safer and more efficient wherever you are. And so really our approach of convergence with all these five technologies allows you to make your chemistry and ultimately your lab process far more efficient. So what is the long-term aim? It's this, to be on a beach with a VR headset and carry out chemistry wherever I am in the world at any time. I'd just really like to close my talk by thanking a fantastic group of people that made it all accessible and some funders which have really helped support us in our dream of what we're doing. And finally, thank you for your time today and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hilton. That was a fantastic and incredibly insightful presentation. As of all the talks today, we're likely going to have a lot of lots of questions come in from the audience. And I can see that we've received some already, so I'm moving straight on to the Q&A now. So your first question from the audience is, what is the limitation or what are the limitations in material that can be used in 3D printing? Hi, Andre. So uh, in terms of 3D printing, FDM printing, you are limited by the thermoplastics that you can use. So we use a lot of polypropylene, uh, PLA, um, PVA, polyvinylidene difluoride, so chemical resistant polymers, or we can use SLA based resins. So again, you can make up your own polymers by making your acrylate resins and polymerizing those. So we, we developed one which is really um, strongly chemically resistant that works really well, but that was, um, yeah, it, it's a huge array of resins and uh, polymers. If you've never tried it, I would recommend FDM printing in the first instance because it's a, a, a good way to get into 3D printing and making items for your laboratory for whatever you need. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Stephen. And moving on to your next question now, uh, how do the AIs that you use know information? So they're about, our AIs are programmed with a backstory. So about them, what they, they're trained to do. So that governs really their, their modus operandi and how they actually interact with you. They also have a knowledge base that you can upload into them. So really, they can hold about a thesis worth of information and understand and know that. And we also give them a leak to ChatGPT. So the ChatGPT allows them to understand wider questions. So again, it's, it's the ability to, um, if the concept is not knowledge-based, they can use knowledge base to then reach out to ChatGPT and develop a logical answer with about a 95 to 97% accuracy, depending on what you ask them, based on what we've analyzed and, and understood. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Stephen. And our next question from the audience is from Kayo. So what type of sensors are you experimenting for the Arduino? Uh, we use a lot of local sensors. So again, it could be temperature, lights, uh, flow sensors, um, thermocouples. We, we use pretty much everything depending on what we want to do. Um, we, quite often, we tend to use commercial ones from the point of view of making it easy and accessible for everyone across the globe. So the idea is most of the things you can find on Amazon. That's excellent. And we still have time for plenty of questions today, but any questions that we don't have time to get through from the audience will be answered offline as soon as possible. So moving on now, um, you mentioned a lot about your AIs. Uh, how accurate can you say that they are? What is the accuracy of your AIs? So from analysis, we've got about 95 to 98 percent accuracy, and that really is that leak to 20 percent uh, chat GPT, which is important. If you go to pure knowledge base because of the way you ask questions, um, you quite often don't get the accurate response, because if what I might think is a question doesn't always work for the knowledge base, and that will drop the accuracy quite enormously. Chat GPT is great, and it does give you some good answers, but it does make up some nonsense. So without the knowledge base, we're down about 50 percent accuracy for some scientific questions. And so that 20% leak, we think about 95% accuracy is good for what we need for most processes. And it's often better than most people. 
Thank you, Steve. That's fantastic to hear. Um, and we have some questions that have been submitted uh, previously. So what are the key advantages in transferring from a hands-on lab, lab to one perhaps that's more online or virtual that you've described in your presentation? A lot of it's time. I mean, we training people takes a lot of time. Again, you quite often have processes that are running that you, you you don't want to stop and to train people on those processes means it's a wait time for that, those people. Having digital twin avoids all those problems. You can jump into the digital version and be trained in that process without having to sort of interrupt the physical process that's going on. Um, so that saves an inordinate amount of time. It's the ability of people to relearn. If they've made mistakes, they can actually sort of jump in and then um, fix things that are going wrong without actually having to interrupt any other process. There's huge savings for that from that effect. I think the, the real-time data is fantastic. I think it's a a global changer for access for education for my point of view. That's amazing. And then just following on from that, how do you see the sort of extended reality, so VR, AR, MR, and spatial computing shaping sort of the lab of the future? How do you envisage the, the field in a few years' time? I think we see a blurring of the real and the virtual. I don't see separate virtual or physical and digital worlds. I think your entire existence in science will be based on a cloud-based information data. Again, a bit like the presentation, I can't show you things that are outside of my talk, but in the virtual world, I can drag you around my laboratory quite quickly and easily and show you everything in there without uh, any issues. So I think that's the, the beauty about virtual reality and um, spatial computing. AR, AI, um, it just changes everything the way we think about things. That's great. It's definitely going to be great to see in the next couple of years how they sort of transition together. Um, we still have time for a few more questions today. Uh, so how how did you initially sort of move from chemistry into VR and AI? I know you mentioned a lot of it was due to COVID. Uh, what specific reasons led you, led you to this approach? I still don't know. Um, it's something which was, we just started looking at it. There's things that we couldn't do. Um, we, we, bought, we had some spare money to get a 3D printer and we just, we bought one on a whim because it was at the time, it was 10 years ago, it was the thing to have. And we just kept using it. We just kept going with it and thinking, actually, we could do this. How can we make our lives more efficient? I think we have telemetrized all our costs over the years. And I think that was a big, a big factor for us is that could we actually make our money go further? Because in academic research, the budgets aren't always there. And so you really want to try and maximize the money that you have. And that was a, a big factor for us. Could we actually make our life simpler and easier? And it's, it's a mindset change. It's then, well, actually I could do this, or I could do this, I can do this. And that, that's where 3D printing took us into VR because we also started to look at low cost electronics. Well, actually this is what is missing. We, we don't track our telemetry, whereas now we can do. Um, VR was a logical step from that. We can't train people in ways that we want to because we have to make the physical objects. Well, actually, can we just use the CAD version? So that's what drove us down that, is that we couldn't do everything that we wanted and we knew there was the ability to do that. And so we just kept going with it. That's fantastic. And we have time for just maybe a few more questions. So why don't more people follow this approach? Um, I, I gave a big presentation to industry a short while ago, and, and when you talk about it to people who never tried it, it, it looks like science fiction. And if I went back to myself 28 years ago and said, this is what we can do, I'm like, you're crazy, you're, um, you're a loony, there's no way you can do this. I think it has to be a slow journey. Again, you can't expect, I, when we went back to the pandemic, no one would have thought we would do uh, Teams or Zoom in the way we use it now, and, and now it's ubiquitous. And that's simply because we had to use it for a need. But also we forget that people don't or aren't comfortable with technology straight away. And that's why we invented the Ica Flow without electronics, because it was the ability to make it accessible, to make it low, low entry in terms of knowledge base. And I think we have to do the same with, with VR um, as well and AI. We have to make it so that people can use it simply and easily. Thank you, Stephen. We have uh, received some new questions. So if you're happy to proceed, I'd be more than happy to, to give you these questions. Yeah, sure. Excellent. So just quickly, how can a sort of a typical user get into this sort of area? How would you suggest uh, someone who works in a lab begin to transition into this? I would look at 3D printing in the first instance, simply because it, it's um, 
you can save an inordinate amount of money with it. I think it's it it makes your life a lot easier. It's and I think the thing is, is I mean, I always take it back to dating. I, I shouldn't do. Um, eventually, someone says yes. The harder you try, the luckier you get. And it's in the, in the laboratory, it's the same thing. The more you try something, eventually you will get to a solution. And you, it's like riding a bike. You you will fall off. You will make mistakes. Just keep going. But the nice thing with three D printing is it's so low cost. You can make mistakes. You're not destroying a thousand pounds reactor. You're destroying a one pound reactor. I think that's the, the mental change to think about. Um, Again, resin is, I think Kai was mentioned about the resin versus polypropylene. Polypropylene is simpler, easier, and cleaner. Um, the resin gives you the chemical resistance that polypropylene doesn't, but polypropylene gives you the flexibility and the ease of production and mass production. It's simpler and easier. That's perfect, and thank you for addressing that question. In that case, we have one final question for you today. Do you think that VR has the potential to open up sort of analytical chemistry to people with physical disabilities? I think it does. I, I um, and it's not just with physical disabilities. I think it's everyone who wants to go around the laboratory can do. We can take children around laboratories in ways that you would never do normally if they're below sixteen. You wouldn't. Well, we're not supposed to bring anyone into laboratories below sixteen. Um, again, that ability to interact with the robotic machine and do things wherever you're in the world uh, also helps people with physical disabilities because you can work with the machine remotely. That's excellent. Um, and we just have one final point to see your sort of views on. It's a very direct question, um, but you obviously have a lot of expertise in this field. So how can 3D, print 3D printing be used in the study on sort of bile acid mediated regulation of intestinal junction proteins um, in viral infection? I just wondered if you have any sort of comments on that, on how sort of 3D printing and VR could be applied to this situation. Um, again, you could easily make a material which uh, allows you to think about or behaves like the um, real physical material in the body. So you, you could actually make a system which looks at the uh, release rates. Um, you could actually have an implant material with 3D printing to help with bile acid production or, or secretion or tissue areas around, um, in associated tissue. The VR would be fantastic for visualization. Again, understanding the anatomy is a really good way of um, using virtual reality. Uh, we use that all the time. So I'm, I've got a nice VR model in my brain that you can have a look around and, and wander around. Uh, you can also 3D print as well if you want to. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Stephen. Unfortunately, that is all that we have time for today, but we really do appreciate your insights and as well as answering all those questions. Lovely. As mentioned, any questions that we don't have time to get to will be sent to the speaker after the event. And you can continue to submit your questions whilst watching this on demand. So feel free to enter them. As with all the other talks in the event, this talk will now be available to view whenever you want for the next 30 days. And that just leaves me to say thank you once again, Dr. Hilton. It's been a pleasure and we will we will be back soon with the next talk.